changing some of the western blots and some of the bands were surrounded by weird rectangles or there were like lines that did not make quite sense and uh, they were very reluctant and, and did not really share original blots uh, and, and the couple of times they did show original blots those appear to have been photoshopped so it's 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 still ongoing. The the company just filed a lawsuit today, so uh, oh, wow. <laughs> that's okay. why I'm a little bit careful. <laughs> They're <laughs> obviously very concerned about um, defamation, but it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's you know it, it's going to be a long story and it's going to take a lot of time to figure all of this out. But I agree that the the concerns I feel are realistic, and I would love to see original data. But uh, the company instead um, is filing. A lawsuit against the people who originally filed the complaints. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I spoke with Elizabeth Bick, a former microbiologist who has worked at the Dutch National Institute of Health and the School of Medicine at Stanford University, who is now a science integrity consultant, where she searches the biomedical literature for inappropriately duplicated or manipulated photographic images, plagiarized text or poor study design and data analysis. Elizabeth's work has been featured in Nature, Science, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and now The Shiki Science Show. So let's get on with the conversation. So hi Elizabeth, thank you for joining me today and welcome to The Shiki Science Show, it's great to have you on. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, let's thank talk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, because I've never really spoken about uh, scientific misconduct before on the channel, but obviously it's such a, a huge part of anyone who's a part of science and beyond. And um, I just think you have so many important lessons and stories to tell us and a lot that, I mean, I could learn from you and I'm sure some of my audience members can too. Um, and I decided to wear a, a white t-shirt for this uh, conversation too, because I know that you have um, a special skill at spotting patterns and I didn't want to distract you <laughs> at all. Um, but be before we get onto that, I just wondered if you could provide um, for my audience who maybe don't know your background, um, what is your uh, background to science? And what were some kind of triggers that made you sort of steer away from the, the basic science research more to now doing uh, scientific um, integrity? Uh, yeah, I'm Elizabeth Bick. I, um, I was born and did my PhD in the Netherlands. So I'm, I'm from Europe and I uh, moved to the US uh, 21 years ago. And I have a background in microbiology. So I have a PhD in microbiology, worked on cholera, on tuberculosis. I've worked in a clinical lab um, in a hospital. And then when I moved to the US, I worked uh, for 15 years at Stanford. Uh, and I worked on the microbiome of humans and dolphins. And so I also started a blog called Microbiome Digest. So for people who are in the microbiome field, I wanted to have a daily update on the new papers in the field. And that blog is now currently run by a team of volunteers, so I don't do it anymore, but I started it. And then during my, my work at, at Stanford, uh, I got interested in science integrity, first in plagiarism. And then by accident, I discovered this, this duplication in a PhD thesis that had plagiarized text, but it also had duplicated photos of Western blots. And I realized I have some talent of spotting duplications in photos in scientific papers. And I started doing that as a hobby, and then I just, I just liked it more than my real work. And so I, um, uh, after doing that for a couple of years, in 2019, I quit my job. I worked at a biotech company uh, at that time. And I am now a full-time consultant, I guess, on volunteer. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I worked on, on finding more examples of duplicated images in scientific papers. And so when you talk here about scientific misconduct, what do you actually mean by that? And I know that um, there's ways that maybe you can classify different types of misconduct. There, well, I'm, I'm looking for uh, problems in images mostly, and not all of those are misconduct. So some are just errors where people might have accidentally included the same photo twice. Uh, but misconduct uh, is, is usually defined as one of three things, plagiarism, falsification, or fabrication. So uh, plagiarism, that's usually refers to text um, where somebody copies somebody else's text or ideas and doesn't give credit. Um, and uh, that is usually related to text, but, but I focus on falsification, fabrication, where falsification is where somebody does an experiment but leaves out a value or makes the value a little bit better, uh, you know, 
that increases the value, so it becomes a positive, for example, from a negative. And then fabrication is where a person completely makes up results. So, for example, you can type in some beautiful numbers in a spreadsheet to make a beautiful graph without actually doing an experiment. So that is definitely not good. <laughs> that is science misconduct. And with images, um, for example, if you would Photoshop an image, uh, I, I, I'm not even sure if you would call that fabrication or falsification. You're making up results, so you could you could technically say it's a fabrication, but maybe a result had been obtained, it was just altered, so you could also classify that as falsification. So I'm not quite sure which of the two it is, but it is uh, it would count as science misconduct for sure. It's not the result that somebody actually had obtained. They uh, they yeah they added or they removed some of the data, and and thus that's not that's not good science. Exactly, and so I think the first kind of introduction of the first sort of case study that I came across regarding this was um, the sort of famous, I think it was 2014 study with stem cells in Japan, um, where they discovered these stark stem cells where they could have rejuvenation with some chemical uh, formula, but it turned out that it was completely um, uh, unreproducible. And Mm -hmm. so I was just wondering if you could maybe talk about some big cases that were quite shocking for you to come across and um, yeah, ones that have been most surprising. Yeah, there, there's many cases. There's whole Wikipedia sites with cases of misconduct. And so it's uh, it's uh, quite interesting to read. And misconduct happens in any, any field of science. Um, so in the Netherlands, where I'm from, we had a very famous case where um, a, a person working in psychology at Tilburg University, and his name was Diederik Stapel, he even admitted to completely fabricating his results. So he did all these kinds of investigations in in school children or adults he investigated he did all these experiments but he made up all these results he never did those actual experiments so this is fabricated results and i've i believe around 50 five zero of his papers have been retracted and he admitted that he made it up like i'm yeah so that's that's a case that shook the netherlands because it was is he was always in the news and and you know he was like very famous uh, and and so he made up all these all these results. And then another case that uh, is worth mentioning is the falsification of the work of uh, Andrew Andrew Wakefield. He published a paper in, oh, well, I think 90, in the 1990s, I believe, where he claimed that the MMR vaccine caused autism in small children. And he presented 12 children and um, sort of made it look like they all got autism after they have received the vaccine. While in reality, he uh, falsified some of the data. He, he um, yeah, he made stuff up. He uh, he changed a lot of the results to make the results fit his hypothesis. And as the result of that paper, the Wakefield paper, which got retracted 12 years later after it was proven that this data had been uh, falsified, uh, as the result of that paper, a lot of people believed that he was right and were very worried about the consequences of vaccinating their kids. And so a lot of people said, I'm not going to vaccinate my kids. And a lot of kids got measles and and probably some people died as the result of that. Uh, Definitely lots of more children had been hospitalized after that paper came out. And he still has a big influence on uh, on public health because there's still a big anti-vax movement and he's very active in that. And so this paper was based on misconduct and had very far-reaching consequences. Yeah, no, that is, that's incredibly shocking. I didn't actually know that case. And so, I mean, in that in that situation, and I know that you did do, you published a study in 2018 or 2016 that looked at the, some of the reasons that someone might perform misconduct. And so, yeah, why, why would someone do this? And what are the sort of more common reasons that you see? Well, it, it all goes back to the pressure to publish, which most of us scientists feel, whether we're a graduate student or a professor, we, we feel pressure from above to publish papers and, and to publish them in high impact journals and to publish positive results. It's very hard, as we all know, to publish negative results. And, and so it's very tempting, especially with digital photography, to change the results to make them look a little bit better because now we have a better chance of getting our papers published and we have a better chance of um, uh, getting a letter of recommendation or get tenure. So most of our career opportunities are tied to the number of papers we publish. And also academia is very um, 
you know, there's a hierarchy structure that is very rigid. And uh, imagine that you work for a bully as a professor and that bully, that professor has a very strict hypothesis and does not want to hear any results that do not fit their hypothesis. This professor might put a lot of pressure on their grad students or their postdocs to give him or her certain results that fit that hypothesis. And they might use threatening language such as, I'm going to fire you or I'm going to hire another postdoc who can produce these results. And so this professor might not directly Photoshop images themselves or, or do any other you know, types of misconduct, but the, the people working for him or her might feel very pressured to, to change the results. So you see sometimes these, these uh, papers from a group of, uh, a specific research group, and they all have the same last author, the same senior person, but different first author result, uh, 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 authorship. So that sort of suggests to me that this is a lab where there's a lot of bullying and harassment and and if you don't publish or this or if you don't obtain those results i will fire you so there's that is i think a very specific specific example of why people might feel that the only way out of that lab with a paper is to uh, is to falsify or fabricate results i see yeah and so i mean given that information i mean how um, you obviously can detect things such as um, images or Western blots and how they can get changed. But I feel like even like within the past five years, more and more papers these days have a lot of computational analyses and um, multi-omic approaches. And so when it comes to being able to detect if misconduct um, happens, what do we do in these situations where it's maybe not so easy to, to spot it? Yeah, you raise an excellent point. It is much easier, I feel, to, to catch my misconduct in, in photos or in images in general, but in plots, line graphs, uh, tables, um, whatever data can be presented in, it has you know many different forms, it's much harder to detect it. So if you think about a line graph, like I said previously, you can type in some numbers and make a beautiful line graph with all the dots nicely on the line, or you can make a bar graph or a Venn diagram, a heat map, uh, ordination plot, you can present sequence data, you can present tables, and it's very hard to spot misconduct uh, in, in those types of data. So I'm focusing on images. I, can, I, can, I might see overlapping images, for example, or cells that have been duplicated in a photo, but in other types of data, it is much harder to detect. So there are some ways, um, some people have developed some statistical tools to analyze data in tables or so, but it's very um, slow, like you, you need to, usually you cannot really get the data. You have to hand type in all the numbers from the tables and then do some analysis. And maybe you can catch, for example, things like um, all the shine, all the standard deviations are 10% of the mean or the average value. And, and I've seen those things and those are quite easy to catch. But if it's really sophisticatedly done, there's almost no way to detect it. Yeah. That's scary, right? <laughs> it's very scary. <laughs> <That's> terrifying. <laughs> it is, um, yeah. And so the, the example, like the reason for why someone might do it, um, you said the pressure to publish and that being in a very academic setting, but is misconduct then just limited to academia or is it also seen in industry? It's also seen in industry, uh, I'm sure, but um, eventually in industry, usually it, it will, research will lead to some product like a drug. And I don't think you can really fake whether a drug works or not. So there might be, and I've seen examples of that, uh, where you see suspected manipulation of data or images or, or whatever in preclinical research. But in the end, the, 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 you know, the final test is whether a drug works or not. And I think that's very hard to cheat. Uh, you can, although I've seen some, there was some recent um, talk about a group of people at a clinical research site who faked results. But in the end, those things would come out. So it's not impossible, but it's much harder once it has reached the clinical stage, like the phase two and phase three trials. And you see that often those drugs fail at those phases. They might look incredibly well in phase one and two, but then in phase three, when it's really large numbers, they, they, they fail. And so not saying that that is misconduct, but, but it is very hard to, 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 um, to cheat in whether your drug works in thousands of patients. I feel that's, that's impossible, but I'm sure there's lots of, uh, 
you know, that like the in biotech, same as in in any startup, there's this push to exaggerate your data to overpromise a little bit, right? We mm. we know like you you want to as a in a in a yeah in a company you want to impress your investors and you want to get more money, so it's it's sort of almost accepted to exaggerate your results a little bit and to overpromise. But with biotech, it is very hard to overpromise. I mean, if you work on let's say um, a cell phone and you overpromise that you can make a camera that can capture, I don't know, so many pixels or so, like you could overpromise, but you you might actually be able, you know, a year from now to technically advance to that level. But with whether or not a drug works, you cannot really uh, make a promise and then sort of ex to push the boundaries and make the drug better. I, I feel it's harder to cheat in biotech in the end. You you have to be more much more realistic in what you promise because you cannot push the boundary as much as you can in other technical uh, fields. Yeah, I see. And I guess like somewhat on from that, how how many biotech companies do you think are somewhat maybe based on some misconduct or some um, incorrect data to begin with? So I guess the kind of example I'm trying to lead towards is there's been a lot of talk about Alzheimer's disease um, recently, and I know that I think you've been following uh, the case. And say, so would you be able to elucidate a bit about what's going on in the, the Alzheimer's field? I have no idea what the percentage would be uh, or the, the absolute number. I'm, I'm sure there's cheating everywhere in any company, uh, in any field, whether it's science or, or you know, other companies. Uh, you know, we, we have seen fi financing, banking, construction. There's, there's fraud everywhere. So uh, I'm sure it happens in biotech as well. Um, with regards to Alzheimer's, I mean, that's a very important topic. Alzheimer's disease affects, you know, not not all of us like directly, but I think all of us, it's safe to say that all of us know people with Alzheimer's and have been maybe very close to a person like that in our families. And, and so it's a disease for which there's no current good medicine yet. And so it's a very important topic that I'm sure a lot of people want to solve this problem want to find a drug that helps against Alzheimer's we all want that and I want that too it's uh, but there have I think with with a important field like that where there's lots of money to be uh, obtained from from grants or from fund funders or venture capitalists I think this might lead to some people feeling that you could cheat and they get some money and they can you know cheat the results but um, so we have seen some companies where there have been suggestion that there was misconduct okay but yeah it, it, at, at least the one i've been involved with um, is a company where that relies heavily on scientific papers with that contain western blots which are protein blots which you know are photos so that's one of the um, one of the specialties one of the things i specialize in and so i i agreed there was a, a petition filed online where people said well, these Western blots look, look, um, I don't know, strange. Like there's there's something weird about them, and I looked at them and I agreed with those allegations. Uh, whether or not the company itself knows this, because this was like sort of a, almost like a contractor, a scientist who was hired to do this research. So it appears that this scientist might have been, and I'm very carefully wording this, obviously, but there 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 were signs of image problems uh, with these papers and, and so I'm not sure if the company itself is involved in it but definitely the scientist who was doing this work appears to have perhaps been yeah changing some of the western blots and some of the bands were surrounded by weird rectangles or there were like lines that did not make quite sense and uh, they were very reluctant and and did not really share original blots uh, and and a couple of times they did show original blots those appear to have been photoshopped so it's 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 still ongoing the the company just filed a lawsuit today so uh, oh, that, wow. that's okay. why i'm a little bit careful <laughs> they're <laughs> obviously very concerned about um defamation but it's uh yeah it's uh it's you know it, it's going to be a long story and it's going to take a lot of time to figure all of this out but i agree that the the concerns i feel are realistic and i would love to see original data but uh, the company instead um, is filing a lawsuit against the people who originally filed the complaints right so complex. and so <laughs> when you like um normally spot these um like these western blots manipulations or image um, manipulations um 
what is the process between you finding the the the, the deed I guess and then mm-hmm. it actually being a paper that gets retracted what are the sort of in-between steps and what sort of barriers do you face along the way um well many barriers <laughs> so um I I look at the images and first of all usually nowadays I post these on Papier, which is a website where you can post concerns about papers and those can be image concerns or other concerns or compliments but those are very rare and so I will uh, mark the the photo saying this this photo this panel looks remarkably similar to that panel or this cell looks very similar to that cell in the same photo and I'll mark these things with uh, I usually put colored boxes around them and sort of mark them and and hopefully make it clear to other people that there's there's a concern and I encourage the authors to send in the original photos to take away my concerns and that rarely happens but officially this is of course not an official way of reporting these things officially you're uh, I write to the editors uh, of the the journals in which the papers have been published and write and they then should contact the authors and and ask for the original data or ask for an explanation and uh, but that unfortunately doesn't always lead to anything and you know there's many reasons that authors maybe not reply or the editors doesn't uh, do not agree with my findings and so I found in an original set of 800 papers that uh, only one third of them gets corrected or retracted so if wow. there's a real concern it could just be an honest error but then the paper needs to have a correction with the correct figures but if it's a real concern where there's a suspected case of misconduct where you know cells have been photoshopped within the same photo for example then that paper should be retracted but retractions and corrections do not happen very often so only in one third of the cases there was action taken and two thirds of these cases are still not being flagged of, of you know still out there without a correction or retraction and does it vary as well depending on the journal that you you find it are some journals easier to like work with than others it's it's hard to tell i feel that journals um there have been some journals that did not respond at all to when i sent them a bunch of papers but there have also been journals where they made a, a pretty fast decision in some papers but with other papers they just did not seem to want to take an in, uh, a step or some action so it might be that you know of the papers where the authors didn't reply for example or were you know could not be found anymore because they had changed institutions for example that in those cases they just did not follow up and so it's hard to say if a specific journal did better or worse than others it seemed to be more dependent per paper Okay. And so speaking of journals, uh, in terms of like the scientific publishing process, um, I think a lot of my viewers probably aren't really aware of what happens between some a group of scientists um, submitting some research and it finally getting published onto the, the journal site. And so there's things like peer review that goes on um, and like accept, reject decisions. And as you said, um, reviewer comments and then revisions. But would you be able to lose states on like the process of publishing a paper and why certain things aren't picked up during this peer review process? It's because peer review is not really set up to find misconduct. I think a lot of peer reviewers, well, peer review is usually done as a sort of a volunteer task, something that most academics feel they need to do. And of course, it's fair because we want our papers also to be peer reviewed, but it's unpaid and, and and the demands on peer reviewers are getting higher. There uh, appears to be, you know, people used to, were asked like this to peer review, let's say two papers a year, and now it's like one every week or so. Like I feel the demand has gone up because it's, I feel not a lot of divert, there's not a lot of diversity in, um, in peer reviewers. Like it's the same people being asked all over again. Um, but that aside, like it's, it's, the manuscripts also get bigger and longer and mm. more complex. And I feel as a peer reviewer, it, it's getting harder every day to peer review because these papers are so long. There's like, I don't know, 60 supplemental figures. Like how can I even wrap my brain around that? And, and they're multidisciplinary much more than they were, let's say 10 or 20 years ago. So papers get much more complex. And I feel as a peer reviewer, I can review one part of the paper, but not 10 other parts of the papers. And so you need more, more peer reviewers almost. So. And then it's hard to look at the images and 
and think of images as, or, th or just think of the whole manuscript with the idea of could this have been fabricated? I feel most peer reviewers assume that the paper is is real. Like they'll they'll search for flaws and and better interpretation of the data, but they don't look at the paper with the idea that it could have been made up. And uh, I, of course, look at that maybe from a different point of view, but it's something that most peer reviewers are not aware of. They might just not look at the data that way. I'm trying to, to post things online on, on Twitter and to make people aware of like, look, there's an image and there's something very wrong with it. Can you spot it? And then the first person who replies might get an emoji award by me. <laughs> so I try to teach people like there's a big problem with the paper mm. or with the image. Look at it from a different point of view, because once you've seen these examples of photoshopping or, or duplications or overlapping photos, I feel, yeah, once you're aware, you'll see them faster. So, um, so I, I hope that also peer reviewers are backed up by, by some editorial assistance from the journal. I feel a paper should not just be peer reviewed, but it should also be judged or analyzed by a professional person who's paid for things like statistical, statistical concerns, or is there ethical approval? Is there, you know, are the, the mice, the animals being treated fairly? There's many things, many ways to look at a paper that a specialist could do better than just one peer reviewer or two peer reviewers. So I hope that journals will have some professionally hired persons looking at papers as well, once they get accepted, for example, they just scan them quickly for a range of potential problems. And how many like specialized people actually are there and how much, I mean, funding seems to be an issue and what funding even is available for people to uh, do what it is that you do? Uh, there's not much funding or awards for, you know, for um, finding problems in papers. I feel most science uh, grants and, and awards are geared towards finding novelty. Just think about the Nobel Prize. It goes, you know, and fairly so. We want science to advance and we want science to find new things and, and build our research on that. But I do feel that some funding should go to reproducibility to making sure that science is good and to find errors and, and find make science better in general. But some people argue, you know, uh, that I that the work that I do and many others actually also um, that, that the work we do is not making science, it's breaking science. It's it's it's, you know, weeding out errors and, and you, they might not think that that's important. I disagree with that. I think it's very important because we we need science to be good because we base our research on the work of others. So if papers contain errors or misconduct, then other people might waste a lot of time trying to pursue that avenue. So I feel it's very important to to uh, have some, some type of error detection um, in science and, and to make, to flag papers that have potential problems. Exactly. No, I completely agree. And the other thing you made me think of was I've had a few conversations with people about this, obviously, because I'm still like very early in my career stage, but how in terms of like career progression, it's often looking at the number of papers or the number of citations in your papers and impact factor, but how maybe we should start to be considering, um, you know, having like publishing negative data, which I know is less exciting, but maybe that should be a factor that's taken into account when looking at um, hiring different people. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts in terms of like improving the current system and making misconduct less common or like making the, the detection better? Well, wow, big question. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, a big question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, one of the, the things I've been discussing in, in my talk, in, during my talks is that we should, uh, we should have some reward system for people being able to replicate science studies. So one of the ways you could achieve that is uh, for graduate students in their first year of doing their research, not starting up a new project, but first replicating somebody else's work. And, and we should then award that by, uh, you know, giving credit to that. Like, uh, for example, on your resume, you should not just have your papers or your talks, but also the papers you have been able to, to reproduce. Um, and uh, once you're a little bit later in your career, papers 
that you wrote that others have been able to reproduce. And I feel that there should be credit given to that, not only that I could replicate somebody else's paper, but that my, my paper was replicated by others. That should be worth something, and we should we should give credit for that. And we should also have journals accepting reproducibility studies. Um, we are making a start with that by pre-registering clinical uh, studies, because very often you promise that you'll publish the results, whether or not the outcome was good or bad. You know, if there is a negative result, we should still want to hear whether a drug worked or not. That is very valuable information. You don't want other people to mm. reinvent the wheel. So um, I also hope we go to smaller experimental publications. So for example, micro publications where you just publish one figure. You just say, okay, this is you know the PCR I did and this is, I did it on a hundred samples and this is the outcome. What, what would maybe typically be one figure in a paper publish that and then have other people being able to replicate that. And we, we don't need to really have journals for that. We can have we can have other people replicate it and that sort of increases the value of an experiment. And uh, maybe we should think outside of the box of classical publications because scientific publishing has become this this very expensive monster that, you know, we we, we I always say we write the papers for free, we peer review them for free, and then we have to pay to get them published. Yep. It, it doesn't make any sense. Like journalism wouldn't work that way, right? Um, people in the New York Times get get paid for their for for their uh, um, for their work, and and we as scientists don't get paid. We actually have to pay the publisher to get our results published, and and so you would hope that some of that money would go to a qu a quality control, but it doesn't because we're finding all these these problems in, in peer so-called peer-reviewed papers, we're finding lots of problems still left. And it also doesn't seem to go to customer service. When I knock on the door of a publisher and I say, hey, there's a pr problem with this particular paper, they very often do not answer or they gave a vague answer, but they don't actually correct it. And so there's no or very limited quality control, at least from my point of view, I'm sure they will say that they do lots of quality control, but it could be much better. And I can see these things just by using my eye. I can see there's a big problem with a paper. And so why didn't they pick that up? And also, why don't they respond to these allegations a little bit faster? Why does it take five years to retract a paper or even longer? That doesn't make any sense. So um, I hope we can abandon partially this, the, the classical scientific publishing model and go towards newer systems that are better a, a better fit for these times where you just do things online and you have other people comment on it. I think that will make much better science in the end. Exactly, yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, at least from the conversations I've had, there seems to be a lot of, um, like, there's a kind of similar mindset to what you're saying, where you do something and immediately you can just paste it online and have other people see it and comment on it. Exactly. Um, there's even a site that I'm somewhat involved in called Research Hub. I'm not sure if you've come across it, but they have some sort of... Um, it's based on blockchain te technology, so there's some sort of incentive that if you publish and then comment on other people's research, then over time you're incentivized through some sort of coin value to, to do mm -hmm. it. So I think that's one model that hopefully will have some value but at the moment if you talk about it to other professors they look at you like you're crazy like this just seems so <laughs> different to the current mm -hmm. um, way in which science is published and uh, speaking of journals still just um the other week eLife announced that they were going to stop doing um the accept rejects decision process I wasn't entirely sure what the story was but um what, were you aware of this and would you be able to explain what it is they've announced um, I've heard on it, uh, about it on Twitter, but I haven't looked into it yet. I had some other big timeline <laughs> deadlines coming okay. up. So, uh, and I'm actually, I, I need to fully disclose I'm on the ethical board of eLife, but I, uh, this came as a surprise. I had no idea. Um, I'm not quite sure. I feel there's some papers that should be, or some manuscripts that should be desk rejected just because they're crazy or <laughs> because they, they're not, they don't have any scientific value. So I'm not quite sure if they will still do you know some initial screening because you know you you don't want to accept everything that comes that is sent your way um i've also always peer reviewed from with the idea of making a paper better not to break it down but to make it better uh and my peer reviews have been very long and critical but but it is with that mindset like we should mm -hmm. 
we should elevate that, this paper to the level where it feels it can be published. But having said that, there are some papers that are just not <laughs> not ready. Like there might be signs of misconduct. There might be signs of complete wrong experimental design that is beyond saving. So, um, but having said that, I'm not quite familiar with their new rules or regulations or whatever uh, you you want to call that. So I'm I haven't I don't know all the details. But from what I've heard. It, doesn't sound like a very good idea, but I might be very okay. wrong. <laughs> and uh, and I'm sure Michael Eisen has, uh, you know, has, he's at least innovative and has good ideas. So I, I do feel we need to, you know, improve scientific publishing, but I don't feel that every paper should be, should be publishable. Mm. <laughs> you know, you can think of papers that are, have a very, like a political agenda where where people say, okay, this 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 paper proves that the vaccine, uh, some vaccine, is causing autism, even though that that is completely wrong, and the design of the study is not not meant to really investigate that. So, there are just studies that don't have a good experimental setup, or you know, the control group is very different at the start of the experiment from the treatment group. Like that's beyond saving. Like you cannot save flaws like that. Like if you know there should be reasons to reject a paper at, for that ground. But yeah, so, but I, I, I definitely should read more about this because I don't exactly know what the rules will be. Okay, yeah, nice, fair enough. Um, and so in terms of, you mentioned you've done all these, um, been a reviewer on many papers. If someone like handed you a paper um, as like, as a PhD student, I'm always trying to find different papers and um, I'm reading as much as I can. But how do I know if, if I look at a paper, if this is going to be a good paper and what are the sort of like signs that this is worth my time to really fully invest and read it? Or should I quickly skip and move to something different? Um, it depends on a little bit on the study. So when it's, let's say, a group, uh, a study where patients are being treated with a drug you have like the basic control group and treatment group i think there's very basic things you can check for are the like i just said is the control group at the start of the experiment very different from the treatment group that's that's a big no like you you want to start with two groups that are roughly equal and they're not going to be perfectly equal but you know in terms of age or or um the underlying disease or gender ratio um so there's all these things you can check for. So that's very basic. Um, and, you know, that would be specifically for a you know, group of animals or, or humans that are being treated with a drug. For basic research, you can also think like what is, yeah, is the set of samples representative for the question you're going to ask? So if, if those things are all good, that's a good start. But then um, if you're asking me how to detect misconduct, that is a very difficult question. And I... You know, I, I can look at images and I can tell you the images look good, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the paper is is real. They could still be fake. I've seen many papers that are completely fake, and you can see it because they the authors made a fatal flaw, made some design error, and you can just see, okay, this paper is completely fake. But you know, if they hadn't made that error, I would not have been able to tell you. So there's there's some basic things you can look for, but then there's many other things that you like even experiments peer reviewer would miss so it's 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 very hard to know for sure that a paper is good yeah i um, mean actually you, you mentioned something um that i learned about only recently in terms of fake papers and something called paper mills and how um there are these certain sites or certain like um places where people can just generate um completely fake data and um, so yeah what's that about so yeah paper mills are are companies that or well the product of companies that sell papers that are uh either completely made up or they're plagiarized things like that so there's different models there are paper mills that uh that so companies that take papers that have been published in some local language, let's say Russian or so, or, or uh, Arabic, and, and that are not in the mainstream English literature. Um, yeah, uh, they are not available for, for other parts of the world. And they will translate that text into English and they change it maybe something. Or they will take an English text 
and then synonymize it. And so you get all these weird phrases like bosom peril, which is breast cancer. So oh, that's one, okay. one type. Of, yeah, and it's, it's those papers are, so they're called tortured phrases and uh, Guillaume Cabanac and um, some other people have worked on that. And they found tons of papers that are appear to be plagiarized, but they're, you wouldn't find it directly because the text has been, every word almost has been synonymized. So that's, that's one type of sort of paper mill. These are mass produced and they're sold to authors. Uh, then there are papers that have been accepted maybe because they, the authors paid the editor in chief because they had like this special issue they had to write and collect a lot of papers for. And then these special issues are um, usually have very low quality papers and there might be a financial contract between the editor and the, the paper mill uh, contractor. And then authors are added to these accepted papers. So these, uh, Anna Albukina, for example, has worked on these paper mills. They're, they're, there's one that's active in Russia. So she has observed that papers were being um, offered for sale. Uh, like this paper has been accepted and we have two authorship spots available. You're, if you want to be the first author, you pay a little bit more, but uh, you know you, you can you get it. So these authors are added to already accepted papers. And then the third type of paper mills that I've seen, uh, those are active in, in China where uh, very specifically for medical doctors working at a uh, a clinical hospital, not research institutions, but clinical hospitals who need papers for their promotion or their, you know, to, to be offered a position at these hospitals. And they will buy authors, authorships on fabricated papers that look very realistic. So they might have photos of, of gels or um, microscopy photos of, of cells or tissues. But you can see that these photos have been are you can find them in multiple papers. So if you know what to look for, you might recognize, hey, that photo has been used in one paper to represent, I don't know, um, a ovarian cancer cell line. But in this paper, in another paper by completely different authors, the same photo is being used to represent a prostate cancer cell line. And oh, wow. you're like, wait, that's weird. And, and so these photos are sort of like stock photos. They're being used in different papers. And these papers are believed to be completely fabricated. So, I mean, it seems like our awareness and I'll say a lot in part due to your work um, of scientific misconduct is increasing. So we're being more aware of it and on the lookout for it. But from your perspective, do you think in, in general the amount of uh, misconduct is in increasing or do you think the problem is getting better? Um, it's hard to know because we can only catch the tip of the iceberg. So... Um when I found a paper mill that looked fairly realistic, but um, that was a, uh, it was a paper about prostate cancer and half of the patients were female, were, me were, were women. And you're like, that's <laughs> unexpected. Mm -hmm. And so you can sort of see these, these errors that they make, uh, the paper mills make, and you can catch, uh, and then maybe you can find other papers that look very similar. They were, they're written on this template. But if they had not made that error, the paper would look realistic. So. Um, there might be there there might be an increase in uh, in papers, and I think it it has to do with the in papers with misconduct with that are fabricated or falsified, and it it has to do with this increased pressure to publish, that seems to get you know higher every year. Um, so, and artificial intelligence is going to to add to this problem. We can use it to detect maybe falsified papers. But we can also use it, misuse it, to generate falsified or fabricated papers. You can, you know, have a decent text written by some bot that looks like a scientific paper and that probably would pass peer review. And we can also use artificial intelligence to generate photos or graphs that look very realistic. We've, you know, seen the examples uh, online, Dell E and mm -hmm. this person yeah. doesn't exist dot com. Like we can we can make movies with realistic looking dinosaurs. I mean, it, it gets just worse and worse. And, or, you know, the images get better and better, but the problem gets worse and worse because mm. we can no longer, you know, next year we can probably no, not, no longer distinguish the, the dinosaur from, uh, you know, it looks very realistic. We cannot tell it's fake anymore. We know it's fake, but it's hard to know. And so we can use AI to, to, generate falsified papers and I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic because I don't think we, we can no longer distinguish fake from real and maybe we can still do it this year but I don't know about next year <laughs> it's just getting that the techniques are getting better so it's very hard to 
to tell a fake paper apart from a real paper. Yeah, no, I mean, I completely agree. And actually, uh, you mentioned Dali, and I was actually the other day in preparation for this was sort of playing about to see if it could, if I typed in Western blots with bands, would it actually be able to make something <laughs> right. slightly comforting? It didn't do a very good job, um, thankfully, but that's at the moment. I mean, who knows? Give it some training, give it some time. And yeah, no, you're right, it's, it's terrifying. And also, I've also seen AI tools where it's meant to help you write the paper where you just start typing and then it just sort of auto fills gaps and I'm like how, how why would you want that I mean I, I, I don't know um so definitely um yeah quite quite scary but in terms of um what else we I mean we've spoken already about some of the ways in which we can try and reduce the amount of misconduct but um in terms of speaking more I guess to early career stage scientists do you think there should be more trainings I mean there was maybe a slight bit in my um undergrads about it but that was it we learned about what a retracted paper is but I guess Mm -hmm. do you think there's a lot of incompetency in terms of like we're just not necessarily aware of what what's happening yeah, I, I think some training is, is definitely good. I've never had any training and I feel that most scientists have an ingrained feeling for what is right and what is wrong. But I do feel it would be very beneficial if uh, beginning grad students or maybe master students would learn about what is accepted and what is not. And I think we're all struggling, including myself. I'm sometimes struggling with questions like, you know, you make a graph and you see a nice correlation But there's one outlier like what do you do with that and um i feel as long as you you have uh you write in your notes that why you left out the outliers or you do redo the experiments i feel that is that is okay but if you do you know if you measure patients and and there's one patient that is a complete outlier what do you do with that that is it's those are tough decisions and i don't think there's a right or wrong answers and but some training on that would be very beneficial but I also feel we should not just focus on training beginning uh, researchers, but also focus on what the the older generation, the more senior persons are doing. And I feel there's a lot of there's a lot of focus and a lot of scrutiny for of younger researchers, but a lot of the senior researchers appear to, uh, you know, if, they, if 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 some of them are accused of misconduct very often they get away with it even though you see these some cases where there have been senior people involved in multiple indications that there was misconduct in their lab but it's the junior person who then gets fired or has to leave academia while the senior person is not punished in any way even though they're responsible for the atmosphere and the the integrity of, of a lab and mentorship and things like that and i feel there's a very there's a lot of blame pushed on junior researchers, but not on the senior. So I feel as an institution, it's good to teach your your incoming students on how to do research, but you should also mm-hmm. hold accountable the senior people. If they are uh, showing signs of not being a good mentor and, and maybe pushing their staff into doing misconduct, they should also be held accountable. And there's just not enough of that. Mm, no, I agree. Um, yeah hopefully things will change and yeah part, partly having you on is to, to raise your awareness and to get people to at least talk about it um but also yeah one of the reasons i brought you on as well is because as you mentioned at the start you have a background in microbiome research and so i thought it'd be interesting to ask you um given that i've come across a few websites or companies even that claim that they can look at your microbiome and predict certain diets or foods you should be eating and so i was just wondering if you could uh, maybe comment on some of the the sort of hype, overhyped or maybe myths that are in the microbiome space and um, what what actual research does actually look quite promising? Well, this, this is a tough question. I've worked at one of those companies myself and that company then now got uh, raided by the FBI and the founders are being accused and charged ah. of insurance fraud. And so I, it's, it's a very tough question. I feel that there's still lots, lots of, um, lots of things we don't know about the bacteria and other microorganisms that live inside of us. But I do feel there's a, there's a, it's a very promising field. In the end, these bacteria can break down some of our food and they can generate all these molecules that we, we don't know yet much about. We're, we're still learning. And it, it's, it's, it was a very promising field and it is still a very promising field, but it hasn't really delivered what I thought it would deliver in you know the next five years or so. Uh, five years ago 
So I do feel we can, it's, it's really cool to look at which bacteria are in your gut and how they respond to different foods that you eat. Like, or maybe you take a probiotic and you might see certain bacteria go up or down or respond to that. Or maybe you, you travel and you see your bacteria respond to that. And I think that is a really cool uh, way. I, you know, we, I worked at a company that offered that for their clients um, where you could just order kits and, and sort of see what the effect was. But then that company wanted to also uh, sort of, can we translate that to a more clinical uh, situation where we can ask, we can look at patient's stool samples and see if they're sick with something, like what is a balanced microbiome? And I, I honestly thought, I think all of us thought, okay, this is a very promising field and we, we can make those predictions, but I feel it, yeah, there's, there's too much conflicting information. And so what seemed to be a very promising field has not yet delivered, but I'm, I'm still optimistic. I do feel we, in the end, we could go to our doctors and maybe have a microbiome test done and, and learn about certain bacteria that are implicated in disease. There was just a paper that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago showing that a particular bacterium was associated with rheumatoid arthritis and and you know it might just be one bacterium or a group of bacterium and but it's it's one of those things there's there's so many discoveries still waiting to be done and i feel there we'll we'll get to that point where we can do diagnostics based on our microbiome but it has not yet i don't think we can make a lot of predictions yet we can we can maybe tell that a person is sick because they have a microbiome that looks sick but we cannot really tell what disease they have and that is what we hoped to um to solve at ubiome but in the end that was yeah was a, was a little bit over promising and uh of course we hoped to reach that point but we we did not at least i i wasn't able to make any predictions in the two years that i was there and and then the the company you know the, the leadership sort of went in the wrong way and and started to think too much more about making money than about what the science could actually deliver. And, and I feel the, the developments in this field have been much slower than everybody had hoped for. Mm. I mean, I think, yeah, it's probably not just the microbiome field, but some like other fields as well, I guess, again, like neurodegeneration. Um, as also well, we've had hope and then things don't uh, go the way we think they will. Um, obviously, I mean, I'm somewhat tempted to go into microbiome research uh, later in my career. I think it's super fascinating. And as you say, I think there's so much we're still yet to discover. Um, so it's a massive interest mm -hmm. of mine. Um, but another thing I just wanted to ask you about is obviously when you sort of talk about misconduct in papers, one thing that um, you get uh, is criticism. And also being online and talking about papers myself, sometimes I also get some criticism and I just wondering what sort of advice you have in terms of being able to deal with, with the criticism. Well, I wish I could tell you that it doesn't bother me, but it does. <laughs> like it is hard to be criticized. Uh, one, one way that helps is to look who, who is offering the criticism. Is it a anonymous troll with 30 followers or is it a respected scientist with, you know, 10,000 followers and, and, and like who is tweeting under their own name. So I, that is one way to look at it. And, and it's amazing, especially I feel as a woman in science, if you make some, if you state something online, um, somehow that seems to attract a lot of trolls. And um, I feel, and I might be wrong, but I, f <laughs> I think a lot of women would agree that we seem to attract more criticism than if a man sat, which would have said the same thing. And on, on top of that, we also get criticized for the way we look or the way we talk or whatever. Uh, the, what we wear and, and, you know, men don't seem to have to be getting uh, too much criticism about those things. So it's, it's really tough. Um, and yeah, I've been continuously targeted. I mean, I get like um, dozens and, and sometimes hundreds of nasty tweets every day uh, with, you know, you go to jail and you're a failed scientist and, um, you know, I hope they will rape you and I hope they will, um, yeah, I, I read the most horrible comments and, and it's, it's, it is, um, disturbing. And with new leadership of, um, of Twitter, I feel that we're not going to, that's not going to get any better. Like it seems that, you know, free speech, um, 
which in my opinion is not the same as everybody can say whatever they want, but uh, it seems that we're heading in a direction where nasty comments are no longer moderated. And that is just horrible. I mean, I'm trying to report all kinds of tweets and they never seem to pass the rules of uh, what is misbehavior on Twitter. So it's only going to get worse. And it, yeah, it's very disturbing. I, I, and it, it's, I, I might get, you know, 40 likes on a tweet, but then if you get 10 nasty remarks, it, it sort of doesn't seem to be balanced. It seems that the nasty remarks eat more at me than, than a like of a fan. So it's, uh, it is, it's tough, but helping, it helps to look at who, who gives the comment. Yeah, well, that's true. That's a good point. And yeah, I'm really sorry to hear the comments that you do receive. Um, but I was just, um, besides talking about how to deal with criticism, do you have any more just like general, general advice to, um, I guess, then researchers of any age and stage in their career? Uh, to give criticism or to... Oh, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> like just general advice. Uh, you don't oh, help okay. them make criticism. Oh, well, like I've, I've always been very critical, but I, um, I'm not sure if this is answering your question, but uh, I... I try to do it politely and objectively. So I feel that helps me, you know, not get sued. Although, you know, there's threats of lawsuits every day. So we'll see how that goes. But it, it, it helps to, even if you're insulted, to, to not choose this, to do the same way, to always try to be respectful and to, you know, answer, to, to take the high road instead of the, you know, trying to insult back. But it, that is tough. And um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure if that was the question. Maybe you should reword it because I don't, don't. Yeah, no, that was, sure that was partly it. it. <laughs> um, yeah, how to give appropriately criticism. But then I guess, yeah, just more generally, do you have any sort of general um, advice for those in research, how to, how to be a good researcher? I don't know if that's a better way to phrase it. Um, well, don't don't falsify results. I mean, always <laughs> like I, I feel appealing to honesty is something that I feel should not be necessary. I feel most people who work in science are there to find the truth. And I, I you know, you, you, you can do great. And uh, if you are in doubt, just, you know, either consult with a more senior person or at least log in your logbook, in your lab book, what you did, why you left, left out an outlier, why you choose to start to grab a certain set of samples instead of other samples like try to to document that as much as possible and if you are going to change a value like like you know leave traces of what the first value was like don't try to hide stuff but also if you suspect that that another person in your lab or uh, another group is not honest that is a very tough situation to deal with especially if the dishonesty comes from somebody above you somebody you know higher in rank and um, I feel you you should either consult again with somebody you trust who is maybe on a slightly higher level and can give feedback, but also document what they ask you to do. If you, f if you are pressured in doing misconduct, maybe not directly being asked to Photoshop something, but saying like, I, you know, if your professor sent you an email saying, I want those results to look like that, or if they ask you in person, you can write that back in an email. So, okay, so we agreed that you asked me to do that and um, and have that email, you know, that's a, then now you have a sort of a paper trail. You can maybe forward that email to your personal email account to have some proof of that a person asked you to do misconduct. Um, and if you try to report misconduct or suspicions of misconduct, again, remain very objective and those cases are very emotional. People are very emotionally involved, but don't make any false accusations. So instead of saying Professor X is a fraud, you could say, well, Professor X claimed in this paper to have used that cell line, but they actually used that cell line. And, 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 and here's some proof, here are some copies of you know, the cell line they used or so. Um, that is more objective and, and try to not make any accusations, but stick to the facts. And that is sometimes very hard, but I do feel as scientists, we're trained to do that. So you could appeal to that and also keep it concise. Don't, don't send, you know, your research integrity officer, a 40 page email, because that does come across as 
you know too long to <laughs> nobody wants to read that like can you can you summarize it in a in a short abstract sort of as you would do for uh, uh, if you would go to a conference exactly yeah and no, i think that's really important advice um and i just want to say again like thank you for everything that you've spoken about today i think it's been like really insightful for me to hear and hopefully for my audience too um and yeah really makes you question and will definitely make me double think a lot when i read papers now um and maybe i'll get past i don't think i'll ever get to your stage of spotting but um we, we can try um and so speaking, <laughs> <Well>. speaking... <laughs> You have you have a couple of decades still to <laughs> to reach that level, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah, speaking of um, being able to help support you back, um, where is the best place to sort of help out or to get involved with what you're doing and yeah to support your your work? Well, I'm on Twitter. I'm at microbiome digest without the e after the m, um, uh, and I'm also on Patreon, so people can support me with. Uh, small amounts of money um, and uh, you know like I'm happy with one one dollar or one euro um, a month uh, but of course like not everybody can afford that uh, and I know that but I'm I'm happy with any support but a like on Twitter is is equally important for me because you know when when I'm in ta attacked by some some people who don't like my criticism um, of their company or their professor then it does help for me to see that my work is appreciated as well Exactly. Thank you. And yeah, so thank you again for coming on. And it was just lovely to have this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for having me on. I love it. So thank you so much. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.